This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. Hi, folks. Before we start the show, I want to ask for your help. If you enjoy Kick-Ass Politics, I hope you'll help us reach our goal of raising our full production budget for 2016 by donating on our website at kickasspolitics.com or at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Thanks for listening, and now enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Ben Mathis, and welcome to Kick-Ass Politics. On October 29th of last year, China's Communist Party made a shocking announcement that they were abandoning the Orwellian one-child policy that's become a disturbing institution in China for the past three and a half decades. One Child began in 1980 as a misguided effort to curb China's population and poverty problem by restricting families to one child per couple. If you wanted to have a second child, you could, but it would cost you. And if you couldn't pay, like so many of China's rural poor, you were forced by the ominous Health and Family Planning Commission to abort that child, and in many cases you were sterilized against your will. Three and a half decades later, the Chinese government decided recently to chuck the brutal one-child policy. Well, sort of. In reality, they replaced one child with a two-child policy. And although they've doubled the number of children Chinese couples can have, the government cost of violating that limit is just as harsh as ever, and the implementation is every bit as heartless. Furthermore, China's quick fix can't begin to correct the many unintended consequences of 35 years of one child, the ramifications of which will echo for generations. Problems such as a rapidly aging population who will soon have no offspring to care for them, the psychological toll of a country that now has way too few women, where entire bachelor villages of men can't even have their allotted two children if they wanted to, because they can't even find a wife, and a steep decline in the Chinese workforce that is threatening the bedrock of the Chinese economy, manufacturing. That's just the beginning of China's problems brought about by the one-child policy, and I'll talk about them with my guest today, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Mei Fong, author of a new book called One Child, The Story of China's Most Radical Experiment. For eight years, she covered Hong Kong and China for the Wall Street Journal, where she won a Pulitzer Prize for her stories on China's transformative process ahead of the 2008 Beijing Olympics and a 2006 Human Rights Press Award from Amnesty International for her series of stories on China's migrant workers. After leaving the Wall Street Journal's China Bureau, she served on the faculty at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Communications and today she's a fellow at the New America Foundation. During her time covering China for the Wall Street Journal, Mei Fong gained a unique perspective on the many ways in which China's one-child policy has permeated every aspect of Chinese life. And today, she'll talk about how the one-child policy came about, what happened to the families who violated it, and the unforeseen social, economic, and emotional impact when big government bureaucracy attempts to socially engineer families. We'll talk about the long-term consequences that are about to become major hurdles for China in the 21st century, the effect it's had on the love life of young Chinese singles, the generation gap that makes America's problems with Social Security and Medicaid look like a cakewalk by comparison, and the economic impact of one child that will require a complete overhaul of the Chinese economy in the near future. That and more in this fascinating conversation with my guest today, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Mei Fong. Coming up in just a moment. to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. Today I'm joined by a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist for the Wall Street Journal, Mei Fong. 
She has a new book that examines the many aspects and consequences of China's one-child policy, which has now been adjusted to a two-child policy as of this fall. The book is called One Child, The Story of China's Most Radical Experiment. Mei Feng, thank you for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me. Well, before we talk about the book, uh, you gave me a little bit of a hard time last night on Twitter. <laughs> uh, let's see, what did you say here? You said, looking forward to being on Kick-Ass Politics, fascinating guests, but mostly dudes. Here's to reversing the yin-yang a bit. <laughs> and you are right. <laughs> when I looked at actually our, our episode history, but uh, it's not that I don't invite women. It's just that we get disproportionately rejected, I think, by women versus All right, men, women. Now you guests. know what to do. Come on, kick ass politics yeah, and yeah, kick so ass. I, yeah, I don't know what that was about. But, uh, you know, you get one sexual harassment suit and then no one wants to come on the show. <laughs> but uh, I'm kidding, folks. But let's talk about the book. Um, the book, again, is called One Child, The Story of China's Most Radical Experiment. And it's just fascinating because there's so much that I didn't know about just how harsh it was. I mean, it's almost Orwellian that any government would try to force this upon people. And it's interesting. There's so many unintended consequences to it. But for anyone who may not know, what was China's one-child policy? Okay, so in 1980... Um, China, which was grappling with a huge population boom at the time, um, decided to launch this uh, population planning policy uh, w to limit uh, growth of, of the population. But um, the name itself is a bit of a misnomer because uh, even though it's called one-child policy, even though we commonly understand it as, the, uh, as known as the one-child policy, not everybody is subject strictly to the one-child uh, rule. So basically about a third of all households uh, and most of these are primarily in urban areas. So we're talking 90% urban, a third, ha are subjected strictly to this one child per family household. But there are exceptions to the rule. Um, so you could maybe have a second child if you live in the countryside and your first child is a girl because they know that a lot of families want sons. Uh, you could have a second child maybe if you're one of China's ethnic minorities. Let's say you're Tibetan or you work in a dangerous profession. Let's say you're a coal miner or a fisherman. Or you could even have more because if you're willing to pay. Yeah. If you're willing to pay. If you're willing to pay. So it's like yeah. a tax code, you know, in America. You know, there's so many exceptions to the thing that, you you know, it's hard for people outside to sort of understand it. Yeah, that is funny because, you know, here we get a tax credit per child. Mm -hmm. There you get it. You get, you get a demerit you points. You get that you yeah. have to pay. Yeah. Yeah. And essentially what it came down to, you say in the book, is if you wanted to have more than one child, you either had to basically pay or abort that yeah. child. Yeah, or get special permission, or um, or, and you could stand to lose, cheat. yeah, or cheat, <laughs> or or hide your your kid, or pretend that it was an adopted child, or all sorts of dodgers that people tried. You know, think of it like prohibition. You know, when yeah. you put something on, people try to go around it, or under it, or over it. Yeah, I was surprised in learning the history of this. It was instituted in I think 1980, right? Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be an answer to this boom in Chinese population, and particularly in poor Chinese, poor rural Chinese populations, something to try and curb that. And I guess it, it was intended to be a, an, an economic policy, basically, that really didn't take into account people's feelings, the social consequences, the effect on the family or any of that. Um, did people balk when this was instituted in 1980? Was there any pushback at all? There was and there wasn't. I mean, on one level, um, it's tr there was a lot of support for people within China to reduce population because if you've ever been in China, you ever tried to take the subway in a city in a rush hour, you will know there is a lot of people. So the sense that resources were stretched, especially when you were coming out of the 70s when everybody was very poor, was very strong. I mean, if you had to stand in line to get your kid into a good school or, or wait days to get uh, you know medical services, uh, you will support it, and people did. The problem was... Um, one child policy and family population planning are not necessarily one and the same. And so the problem was, you know, people supported the idea of reducing population and having smaller families. But not everybody wanted to have this very rigid, very strict, only one child per family rule. That was the problem with that one. 
Yeah. And one of the things that I found kind of intriguing about this is that the one child policy was essentially created by the Chinese military with no outside input from, say, sociologists or economists who might have been able to predict some of the unintended consequences down the road. Why would they embark on the most radical experiment in social engineering without having done some research or consulted the experts? I know. It's kind of funny, right? Um, at this time, when China started, this was 1980, right, when it, when it embarked upon it. So they were doing a lot of thinking about this in the 70s. This was coming straight out of the Cultural Revolution. And if you yeah. know the Cultural Revolution, that was a period in time where basically all of the intelligentsia in China suffered greatly. They were persecuted. Um, they were treated badly. Some were even killed. So coming out of that, very few of them had the kind of political capital or even the confidence to speak out about this sort of thing. The only group of in, uh, academics who were left untouched were the military scientists, rocket scientists. Mm. So they were the ones with the political capital. They were the ones with the equipment. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily an argument that they were the ones with the ideas. Basically, they were the enablers. Um, you know, the Chinese leadership had said, look, we want to raise our country economically. Deng Xiaoping said, I want to set a goal, a target, 1,000 U.S. dollars uh, GDP per capita by the year 2000. And so the military scientists worked it back. It's like a rocket trajectory. If you want to arrive at this spot, <laughs> this is what you it. need to do. And so they said, look, we can't arrive at this goal without going, you know, DEFCON 1 to the one-child <laughs> policy. Uh, so that's what they did. and then, But then, you know, all these people like demographers, social scientists, economists, you know, who might have interjected some idea to the human behavior, you know, hang on a minute, you know, um, they didn't get a chance to say boo. And most of the point, wow. more of them didn't dare say boo because the, the repercussions for voicing an unpopular opinion was so, yeah. you know, strong. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so there was a lot of politics to it. Yes. I mean, the intellectuals and the economists and sociologists probably were not that welcome, perhaps, to you know, have a voice in this. Well, yeah, and also and demography as a science was still very undeveloped um, in China. They didn't okay. even have a proper census count at that point. They didn't know really? how many people were in China yeah, at they, the point when they decided to curb it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and the idea, again, was that they wanted to reduce the population in the poor rural areas, I think, right? So they intended it as a roundabout way to reduce poverty and boost the Chinese economy. Today, China is booming, and the government would attribute much of that prosperity to the one-child policy. Is that credit misplaced? I think so. I mean, I one of the things I did in the book was, you know, look at. I mean, I I worked at the Wall Street Journal. I write economic stories, so I wasn't looking at this in an ideological point of view. I was just looking at it. You know, was it a good idea economically? I talked to a lot of economists about that, and many of them said basically, no. If you look at it as a strict GDP double digit rise, you know, people tend to equate. China's, you know, growth and the one-child policy is having the same because they happen at the same time. China opened up for the reform. China launched a one-child policy. It all happened thirty something years ago. Therefore, people assume it one had something to do with the other. But um, the main reason why China grew double-digit GDP growth for the last thirty years was basically. Um, the government stood out of the way of the people. You know, they used to be a socialist plan economy, and what they did was they stopped being that. They said, let private enterprise grow, let um, private investment grow, let's encourage foreign investment, let's reform all these lumbering state-owned enterprises. And all of this had much more to do with the double-digit GDP growth than the number of babies born. Okay. Um, so, I mean, one of the people I quote in the book is this guy called Art Krobler. He's one of the most respected economists in China, and he, he has a quote Let's say China grew 10%. I would be surprised if more than 0.1% of this was due to the one-child policy. There are a lot of unintended consequences to this policy, but there are three main ones that China is now having to grapple with. Uh, the problem of this Too rap old. <laughs> yeah, everyone's a rapidly aging population, and really, I mean, no one to take care of them. Because traditionally, correct me if I'm wrong, in China... You, you don't just shove grandma into a retirement home. The family takes care of the parents and the grandparents. Mm -hmm. And if you only have one child, that's a, a hell of a burden to put on one child. Yeah. They call it the 4 two, one strategy. Four adults, uh, four grandparents, two adults, one kid. So he's the bottom <laughs> of that apex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's at the bottom of the pyramid there. Well, yeah, the other thing that you talk about here, under the one-child policy, parents, and you, you've had for many, many years 
a male centric society mm-hmm. even before one child. Yeah. So parents would they had a, a female child either abort or or give away uh, a, a little girl because they wanted to have a, a male heir. So now you have this disproportionately male yeah. society in, in China, and you know guys have. Guys can't find a wife, <laughs> and you know, yeah. the reproduction rates are plummeting on top of the one-child policy. You already have that, and now on top of that, there are no. Even if you wanted to have three kids, you can't because you can't find a wife. Well, yeah, that's the thing, right? So it's made the population very unbalanced. You know, very skewed to males, very skewed old. So you know, China right now has something like thirty million surplus men. They call them guanggong, you know, bare branches. They are reproductive yeah. ends yeah, of right. their biological tree, um, you know, family tree. And and that's that's a, and these are usually tending to be the poorest of the poor. Farmers, at, at the end of it all, the ones that have it hardest. They can't woo women. Women don't want to live in a farm. They can live in a city. <laughs> um, so, it, it you know, and where are you going to find all these women? You just, you know, you just can't, unless China imports a, a, a population of women the size of Canada. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's just not going to happen. And and you say in the book that that's probably not likely to happen for them to open immigration up to. Well, I mean, never say never with China, right? Yeah. Because they certainly had some very, um, you know, in a, uh, you know, radical ideas along the social engineering front. But, you know, um, but certainly we start seeing a lot of uh, rise in uh, sex trafficking. So you do see a oh. lot of that in the border countries, North Korea, really? Vietnam, Cambodia. There's a rise in that. Um, I think there was a... NGO in North Korea that estimates like a significant proportion of North Koreans in China are basically women who have been trafficked there at a sum of roughly about 1500 US dollars. And even at the less reprehensible levels, there seems to be from reading the book, this general commercialization of marriage and traditional courtship. In fact, you say that uh, parents have an unusual amount of input in their children's uh, romantic choices these days, and you even talk about marriage markets springing up in China. What what goes on at a Chinese marriage market? Well, let's say you know. Here's the thing, right? So you have a confluence of several things that are brought about by the one child policy. One, you have a singularly large percentage of one child households. So of course, parents are very focused on that one child and yeah. all the decisions they make. And second, you have a gender imbalance. So let's say, for example, you're a father of a son and you want to get him married and you know there's a big gender imbalance. There's all sorts of implications involved in getting your son married and getting your family line out. You have to say, for example, every family of a male um, son has to beg, borrow and steal to buy property to make their sons more attractive on a marriage market. So so Colombia economists have actually estimated that the gender imbalance in China has actually contributed to as much as like 30 to 40 percent of an increase in housing prices from a certain period between 2006 huh. and 2009, right? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. We all, we, here in America, we call it uh, only child syndrome. And you have, you have a whole chapter that talks about a chapter titled Little Emperors. Little Emperors. That talks about the privileged place that uh, these families one child has mm-hmm. and how they're doted on and spoiled and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's now creating these 20-somethings who have this sense of entitlement. I have to think that that's not going to play well, and there might be a lot of pushback at a certain point between them and the more authoritarian policies of the Chinese government. That's a theory. That's interesting. I mean, there are a lot of theories about what this means to have a little emperor nation, right? And, you know, the science on this is always a bit fudgy, right? Because this is social science. Right. Um, so I looked at a whole body of research on that. So there was a whole r- array of singleton studies that conclude, you know, anything from yes, there are issues to no, there are no issues to yes, there are issues, but they're good issues. Singletons are better educated, smarter, more well adjusted. So it's very inconclusive on that front. But there was one study I found significant because, um, and this was done by Australian economists, because what they did was instead of looking at um, comparisons between children who are singletons and children with siblings, they compared cohorts, one born after 1980 when the one child policy was launched and one launched uh, before that. And instead of doing behavioral surveys, which a lot of these other studies did, what they did was they had all the uh, cohorts play games. So games to measure your entrepreneurship, your your leadership, your 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 sharing, your your appetite for risk, and they found very marked differences between the two cohorts. The the, really? the little emperor generation was basically they said 
much more risk averse, much less optimistic, and much less really? sharing. That's yeah, the so, little emperor generation. Yeah, that's the little the, the huh. generation born after 1980. It was Risk a very stark us. difference. That's okay, this is one study, so we all caution. Yeah, one study okay. does not make a summer, <laughs> as you say. But I, I do agree with one thing, which is in the course of my many interviews with people who are so called little emperor, if you think about it, right? The oldest of this little emperor generation, they're not children anymore. They're in their 30s and 40s. So yeah. the pyramid is turning, as you say. Yeah. So their parents are in their 50s and 60s. Their grandparents are 80s and 90s. This is a period of time when China's you know, um, you know, um, social service system is still very evolutionary. Yeah. So all of this is coming back, chickens coming home to roost. You, you are going to have to take care of a huge population of people who are aging very fast, very little support institutionally. It's all going to come down to you. So my argument is that little emperor is going to be a little slave, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not, yeah, yeah, it's not going to be so great when he uh, yeah, you know, turns you know. 40 or 50 and has to take care of mom and dad. <laughs> Yeah, the other thing that kind of relates to the question that I just asked, and, and you touch upon this in the book, is the idea of having a lot of men with no wives and a lot of time on their hands and no prospect for marriage might be a powder keg, similar maybe even to, to what's going on in the Middle East, although in many ways very different. Um, is that a situation that could be ripe for dissent and uprisings, mm -hmm. violence? So again, you know, so I looked at a body of research on this. So um, any society with a huge gender imbalance is not a happy one. Yeah. Now, how it manifests itself differs from place to place because there are all sorts of circumstances. There are theories of sociologists have argued that a, a more male China equals a more warlike China, that China is that going to be sense. much more muscular and foreign. I, I personally think that's more speculative. It's not very helpful, you know, to, to you know, to, to, you know, and I think there are many reasons why China is much more aggressive on the global stage uh, beyond the simple gender issue. However, I do find the evidence that links gender imbalance with crime to be much more uh, convincing. So uh, there have been economists who do the studies and they compare provinces where they have a huge gender imbalance with uh, provinces which have a few. And they do find there's a significant correlation that every place that has a gender imbalance, there's, I think, a, 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 rise, a corresponding rise in crime. What yeah. kind of crime are we talking? We're talking crime against women, violence, crime against crime, women. Sexual, I mean, no, of course, and bear in mind, that. relatively speaking, China, relative to some other places, the crime rates are very low, and this is partly because right. this is a police state. You yeah. really hurt. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of appeals or law courts or things. If you get caught, you're in jail, and that's that. Um, but. Um, so I've, I, you know, relatively speaking, I've, I've traveled in Middle East, I've traveled in India, I've traveled in China, and I felt relatively safe in China. You know, and one of the things I talk about in my book is when I go to a bachelor village where there are very few women yeah, of marriageable age. And before I'd gone there, I was kind of nervous. I was like, what is a bachelor village like? Is it full of lonely, horny men lurking <laughs> around? Do I have to be proactively a little bit, you know, safe and careful, yeah. um, you know? Sense. And um, but I found that um, in general, a, a bachelor village in China is like any other village in China, which is to say it's mostly filled with old people and children because the men who are registered as uh, dwellers in the village who have their household registrations, they can't make a living on a farm. They have to go right. out and work in the cities. But unlike the women, they come back because they stand to inherit the farms. The women have yeah. no inheritance, right? So they go and they stay gone, which is why this place had no marriageable women. And so what it led to was a rise in bridal scams because here's the thing. In order to get married, every family now has to pay a bride price. And because of the scarcity of women, the bride price has shot up like 10 years worth of farm income. So if you yeah, got a son, you got to borrow money to, to get him married off. And I remember um, I, the, and this place had led to a scam. There were a whole series of runaway brides. And I thought, wow, this is like a movie, right? <laughs> All these women scampering away. And, um, and I thought, you know, and I interviewed this um, man, uh, this father, whose son was one of the rejected bridegrooms and he had another son waiting in the wings and he said i don't know what to do i borrowed all this money to get my son married off and now his bride is gone and i got a second son uh, I, I don't even know where i'm going to borrow the money from i wish i had daughters and there was a part of me because you know here's the thing i am a one of five girls in a Chinese family, a very traditional oh, wow. Chinese family. Now, you and that did not is, grow up in China. I though. didn't. We're what we call so you overseas Chinese. To the policy. Yeah, we're what we call yeah. overseas Chinese. I'm a second, a third generation of uh, Chinese. I grew up in Malaysia. But we cling to the old ways, in some yeah. ways more so because we never had the cultural revolution, I think, to eradicate right. these things. Yeah. So I'm the fifth daughter. My father is the 16th son 
in a family that really cares about sons. So to 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 be a daughter is, is a huge disaster. <laughs> you know, it's like Downton Abbey. You know, okay, yeah. oh, you know, nobody can inherit the 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 the, the mansion. You know, you need a, a third or distant cousin. The women don't count. That was what it was. Yeah, I, and I wonder, as young women, does that do something to your sense of self worth? When your, your, your own family says, you. well, I wish I had a son. Well, it made me much more aggressive, I think. <laughs> oh, really? I was like, I'll show them. You know, I will show them. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And in the book, you talk about an interesting aspect of that because there's a there was, I think, a saying or a policy in China of raise a daughter like as a son, a son like yeah. a son. And it's led to all of these uh, young women in, in urban environments who are socially mobile, they're working very well educated. And they're, yeah, they're they're earning an income and you have very few women to begin with in China. And then the women that you do have you know, they don't want to get married. They've got a great deal. <laughs> well, that, for urban women, so the quali- qualification, yes. yeah, so women born. So you, if you're a girl, you're a female born in the city after 1980, your chances of getting better fed, better educated, best time in any modern Chinese history. That's true. And that's partly because of the one-child policy. Um, although you might argue other places like South Korea, and all women also made the same advances without anything so harsh in a way of a one-child policy. Right. But the argument now, again, is what we're seeing, and a lot of feminists argue, is there's a backlash uh, now because of this demographic pressures. You know, part of the reason the one-child policy was promulgated because the government was very unashamed. We want to reduce quantity to increase quality. We want smart, educated people. And the target group for smart, educated people is smart, educated mothers. You know, we want university educated women to have more children. So now they switch to a two-child policy because they need more smart workers. They want to encourage people to get married and have children. They want particularly educated women. But women at the same time, are doing the other thing, right? They want to re- delay marriage, go to college, grad school, same thing as you see in any other part of the world. And what was resulted in, in China, there's a labeling now. You are considered a leftover woman on the shelf, you know, like the remains of a doggy bag. Wow. If you are not married, starting from the age of 25. Wow. 25. And you know, here's the thing, yeah. bear in mind, the legal age for marriage in China for women is 20. Oh, that's right. So yeah. you go from, you know, you go to game over in just five years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's really short. Yeah, yeah. That's no, not much time to, to, you know, sow your wild oats and have fun, I guess. No, not it's at a all. Very small window. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then I'll be back to talk more with Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Mei Fong. Back in just a moment. If you're interested in my conversation with Mei Fong, then you'll enjoy her new book, One Child, The Story of China's Most Radical Experiment. And right now, you can download the audio version of that book for free with a special promotion for our listeners from audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics for a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook download which can be One Child by my guest today, Mei Fong, or any of Audible's 180,000 titles. That's audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the sponsor link on our webpage to download the free audiobook of your choice. And now, back to the show. We're back, and today I'm talking with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Mei Fong about her new book, One Child, The Story of China's Most Radical Experiment. Well, Mei Fong, on top of one child policy, you also now have rising infertility in China. Yeah, so here's the thing, right? You can't turn it on and turn it off, People, uh, the authority is discovering. you know. So yeah. rising infertility is a factor of modern society, right? Um, women put off childbirth, right. they go to school, they stay in school longer, they start families later. So that's one reason why. But there's another reason that um, the Chinese are exploring in a way, which is the link to pollution, um, oh, interesting. Yeah, so um, okay. they, 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 it's not the evidence is not conclusive so far, but they've launched all these major large scale um, studies that um, are trying to examine because th- there are significant uh, fertility drops. So they're they're wondering: is it due to the air? Is it due to the water? Is it affecting women more? Is it affecting men more? So we don't know the answer to that. But again, you know, we made all these references to Orwell and Huxley. Actually, yeah. one story which is very significant is this one called. Margaret Atwood's story. It's called The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, yeah, I remember and it sets up yeah, it sets a future where 
a whole population is infertile because of pollution. And because of that, women become scarce commodities. Fertile women become scarce commodities, tradable objects. And you kind of see that in China a little bit. There's a rise in a mistress culture again, concubine culture. And so you might argue, okay, if you have an imbalanced population, women as fewer women and men. Theoretically, they should have the upper hand. But my argument is because China is still a patriarchal society, I do not see the, the, the shortage of women as giving them the upper hand. In fact, I suspect it's going to re- 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 result in the commoditization of women. Since we brought up the subject of uh, the fertility issues in China, you yourself talk about having dealt with that. Yes. You were uh, taking fertility treatments or trying to conceive when you were in China. And so you directly dealt with the programs that they have in place for fertility, which, frankly, it sounds like there aren't many. There aren't many in a one child society. There well, aren't a lot of incentives for, yeah, for they regulate it very strictly. I mean, here's the funny yeah. thing, right? When technology clashes with policy, when you can do something, technology allows you to do something that policy does not. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I found when I was in an IVF clinic in Beijing was a lot of people are doing IVF not necessarily because they're infertile, but as a way to get around the one-child policy. Yeah, because if you have twins or triplets, it's uh, considered as a single life birth. So you do, you are not liable for fines. You're not liable to lose your job. So, you know, it's almost becomes a sort of buy one, get one free kind of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Eight uh, that children. That almost seems a little dangerous to me to, to be monkeying around with to that degree with something like that. Well, like, the other... What do I know? I'm yeah, the other thing that's actually affecting California is that now you have a significant rise in the number of high net worth individuals from China coming here right. to explore all these third-party reproductive technologies in California because oh, the one-child policy so regulates yeah. so many of these things. Uh, so surrogacy, for example, is illegal in China or in a gray area. So they come here instead. A couple episodes ago, we've twice this has come up, uh, the advances in genomics issues of, you know, designer babies and that type of thing. You talk a little bit about that yes. in here, about mm-hmm. this one-child mentality yeah, to, because, a per- to make a perfect child. So again, here's this interplay. When science makes something available, what will happen then? So we are at progressing along that point where we get more choices. So now you can screen for uh, gender. You can screen for disease. And in some cases, you can also do a kind of a rough pre-selection in terms of intelligence. For example, if you get a, a egg donor, and there are Chinese who are here who have driven up the price of Asian egg donors, and they they also set demands because they, they are the biggest buyer. So they say, we want smart, we want tall, we want double eyelid folds, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So, um, so these are very rough markers, obviously. And but you know, if you go down the line, this is speculation. What happens when more options become available? And my argument is the Chinese are going to be at the forefront of this because the one-child policy for the last thirty years have already predisposed them to pre-select and make hard choices in a in a in a business of parenting and choosing children and building families. So it gets to a point where you become almost that like you say too rational (laughs) in your desire or, you know, your family decision making. And, um, and this is a difficult thing because uh, part of the reason why we want to have children is, is, is a very emotional, emotive issue too. So, you know, so uh, one of the arguments I have is that, you know, what happens now? The Chinese government is trying to persuade people to have more children, um, have more. And, and when you, and a lot of people are saying, no, it's too expensive. We're not going to do this. Um, The one child, uh, policy has become almost a victim of his own success. It's 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 created yeah. this mindset. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the big problems is you know you have this economy that's built on manufacturing and having this huge workforce. In the long term, it looks like that workforce is going to be dwindling, and you know. Oh, one, it's already happened. Yeah. Is there going to be an adjustment to a different type of economy from yes. manufacturing? Or yeah, what? China is, you know, the, the, in the early stages of its growth, it did what we call the low-hanging fruit, right? Um, mm-hmm. Manufacturing, cheap labor. Uh, it's a transition. A lot of uh, uh, countries like Hong Kong, Japan, they did that initially too. We used to see a lot of dolls that had the words made in Japan, and you know, <laughs> yeah. and now Japan doesn't make dolls, you know. Uh, but here's the thing. So they want to transition into a, a sort of a consumer-based economy, more like what the U.S. is, okay. you know, less of an export-based economy, making cheap shit for other people. Mm-hmm. Excuse my language there. Wow. But um, they want to transition into that. But the problem is um, you're going to have a consumer-based force that is um, significantly old 
you know, a significant, you know, the, the chi- retiree population in China, by 2050, one in four Chinese will be a retiree. And that's not typically the demographic you associate with buying a lot of stuff. China, right. we talk about now, world's largest cell phone market, world's largest car market, PC market. Yeah. Well, old people don't buy the latest cell phones every year. Yeah. You know, they might Grandma buy adult diapers. Do a lot of impulse buying, <laughs> does she? Yeah, yeah, no. So, so that will be difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible and the China market is suddenly huge, you know, so even a small percentage of young people people it's, it's, it's big it matters a lot but that said you know you're going to have a significant population of elderly and that's not going to be helpful at all for that transition yeah. no yeah. a friend of mine who does a lot of business in china mentioned to me a while back i want to ask you about this because it, i guess it's a another one of the uh results of this little emperor mentality is throughout the past 30 years when you've had the one child policy you had one child and there was a focus on for lack of a better phrase quality over quantity. So, you know, you would have people who were blue collar, working class families working in manufacturing jobs, and they would had one kid. So they put all the resources toward educating him and giving him everything that he needed. And then once he gets out of college, I mean, that kid doesn't want to go take a manufacturing job. Of course not. (laughs) The next generation that is there, they're not going to want to take over for dad. No, not in that field. So that's a problem. So the problem is China's transitioning in that phase. So a lot of the jobs that are available to be had are still in the manufacturing sector. Meantime, they're pumping out a lot of um, university graduates who can't find jobs. Who, In fact, their first job or second job, they probably make less than a a factory hand uh, because the the economy hasn't transitioned to that. They haven't uh, grown the services industry sufficiently. So there is a, so this uh, little emperor generation. So the other thing we have is a huge amount of dissatisfaction as well because of that. Well, I want to talk about some of the personal stories in this book you bring up. Um, You talk a lot about two significant events in China in 2008 that seemingly had nothing to do with each other and seemingly have nothing to do with one child, the earthquake in the Sichuan province and the Beijing Olympics. What did these two events tell you about the impact of one child? What did you learn from that about this policy? So the the big event initially was the 2008 Olympics, right? And this was more than just a sporting contest. It was um, built as China's coming out party. It was seen as a way for China to demonstrate that it had, you know, come on to a, as a major global superpower. It had gone from being defeated in the Opium War and, you know, the mm-hmm. Cultural Revolution to, you know, uh, Phoenix from the Ashes. This was this was the big thing. And it was a major marketing, economic exercise. You know, think of all those billions of people that Adidas and, and, and Nike wanted to tap, you know, the billion strong consumer market. So it was all that as well. But it was also the representative of the China's, it was a justification for China's models of growth at all costs. This is what happens. We put this all in it, and here is the result. We are one glowing, shining city on the horizon. That was what it was. Now, the Sichuan earthquake, on the surface of it, looked like just a natural disaster, you know, that killed a lot of people. But what we, I later discovered was, you know, not only were a lot of people killed in the earthquake, it was an 8.0 right to scale earthquake, over 70,000 people killed, China's wow. major, biggest natural disaster in 30 years. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the people killed were school children because the schools yeah. collapsed, they were poorly built. And not only that, I discovered this area where the earthquake happened was actually a test ground for the one child policy. Before they launched it nationwide, they weren't sure it was going to succeed, so they experimented in certain areas. This was one of those areas. So when the earthquake happened 30-something years later, not only were our children killed, most of them were only children. And that was the big tragedy that the government tried to um, cover up because the story was going to be Olympics, China's rising you know, party. They right. steamrolled over all these parents who had tremendous um, you know, suffering. And you know, one of the weirdest and strangest things that I found was in a matter of weeks after the earthquake, a lot of parents were rushing to hospitals to reverse sterilization processes that they'd been forced to have as part of the one-child policy because they were so desperate to conceive a replacement child before wow. it became too late. Oh, my gosh, that's terrible. Well, what were some of the other personal stories that really touched you while you were writing this book? Well, you know, like I I mentioned talking about um, going to this bachelor village, you know, and one part of me, that feminist, unwanted daughter part was like, yeah, strike a bro for the patriarchy. But actually, (laughs) um, I met one of these, uh, you know, rejected bridegrooms whose wife 
you know, had just run off, uh, who was a runaway bride. And he was really a gentleman. He, he, mm. he refused to say anything bad about this woman who had taken his money and run. And he said, I, I understand that she had all these pressures. He actually suspected that she, she was more than just a blushing village maid. He, he thought he, he, you know, but, um, and he had bought her a motorcycle. So when I talked to him and his family, they had a bright red motorcycle in the middle of the living room with handlebars, you know, that were tied with red ribbon and just standing there, you know, it was just like a testament to a lost dream he had. So uh, on one level, I'm like, great, you know, you know, let's, let's strike back for all this bad treatment women have had. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm looking at a guy like him who basically has a lot of broken dreams. And then these are not his fault. It's, it's a result of this longstanding, you know, culture and policy clashing together. And he's left at the end of it all. He's the flotsam yeah. and jetsam at the end of it. And there are 30 million wow. of him like that. Another thing that you talked about in here that I thought was really sad is that there is a form of apartheid in China. You talk about, I think, that, I hope I pronounce this right, the Haku or Huku. Yeah. Um, and it Huku, created a yeah. permanent, the, the one child policy created a permanent underclass of citizens uh, who were born in violation of the policy. Yeah, well, and, here's and the thing, right? So there, there are several things that are issue here. So in China, they, they have a, a whole system of registration. You don't exist without that, the bureaucracy and all. Mm -hmm. And the one-child policy, um, you know, you're required to get a birth permit, a permission to have that child before you get it. You don't get it if you, you know, and if you don't get it, your child won't get a household registration. He won't exist. He won't be able to go to school. He yeah. won't, you know, he won't be able to get married or get a job or anything without fake papers or anything. And this is a problem. And there are 13 million of these kind of what we call go children um, that don't exist. They have no rights. I talked to some of them. Uh, there's a girl I talked to in there. Her name was Snow. She's 20 something years old. She's never been to school, um, not been allowed to go visit the doctor. She has to use, uh, she has to borrow her sister's library card <laughs> to even just borrow books in the library. Wow. She can't buy a train ticket because you have to show ID for that. Um, she told me during 2000, I think there's a period where Hillary Clinton was visiting Beijing and she tried to show up at the Tiananmen Square every day to demonstrate. She wore a sign that said, I want to go to school. Wow. Yeah. God. So there's just thousands or millions of people like this who were born outside the system. Yeah, it's not their don't fault. Exist. But they, 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 and for someone like her, it's too late. She's missed schooling. You know, she, yeah. she, she, she's, she's, everything she is is locked in now. She can't, you know, she's never going to be a yeah. doctor or, uh, or aeronautical engineer or something because she's missed all these opportunities. And the family, and in many cases, it's because the family didn't, couldn't afford to pay couldn't the fine afford. for yeah, a second afford. child. They Can they pay afford. off that fine? Well, How the problem is work? it's very arbitrary. So, you know, it's judged in a system of, mul of multiple of your household income between two and 10 times typically. And the two to 10 is a huge difference, Jeez. right? You know, yeah. um, and so a lot of it's very dependent on the um, household, uh, the, the um, family planning official in question who decides. And, um, and they may decide to add the the policy as you make things difficult for them. And, and so it's very hard. So in one sense, also, the one-child policy has created a widened inequality divide in China, which is already yeah, huge. Yeah. Because guess who can afford to pay those fines? It's the rich. Yeah. Guess who is not going to be taken away for a forced abortion? It's the rich. So you know that whole saying where you say the rich get richer and the poor yeah. get children? Well, in China, the rich get richer and children. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it, what happened if you were, say, a single mother? Say you had an affair and you don't have a husband and had a baby out of wedlock. What happens there? It would be very hard for you to get that child registered because you don't have a birth certificate. You can't get a birth permit. You don't get a birth permit. Your child doesn't get uh, his household registration. He wow. doesn't exist. Yeah. So the, the phenomena of the single mother is, is very rare in China. Really? Hardly ever happens. You can't, really? you know. So China's system is still very structured to, even though it's abbreviated, smaller families, it's still a man, a woman, and a child. That's how they, they structure it. So there are very few variations yeah. on that theme. Yeah. So could a single woman have had a child legally in China under um, one child? If she pays. If she pays. If she's rich, if she has influence. But she's influence. not even supposed to have one child if, if she's a single mother? It's very difficult. Really? You know? wow. Aside from the social stigma, it's just a sheer weight of bureaucracy yeah. to get through that. Well, in their infinite wisdom... The Chinese government's uh, brilliant solution to this was to go from a one-child policy to a two-child policy. <laughs> Isn't that just doubling down on the same social engineering, just tweaking it a little? Yeah. So, um, you know, China, as we know, we I talked about all this too male, uh, too old, too rich. It's headed for a sort of a demographic, um, you know, 
iceberg, <laughs> if yeah. you might call it that. So the only way to sort of avert it is to drop this policy. And uh, demographers and economists and sociologists have been arguing this for years, for the last decade at least. They've been providing all this data that shows that it's a huge disaster. They've got to stop it now. But, you know, it's, it's been small steps. So um, in a two-child policy is still it's a bigger playpen, but it's still a playpen. Yeah. Um, and it, chances are it's not going to make a significant difference because they have every loosening they've had to allow more of that target demographic of urban people, urban smart people to have more children, have not resulted in baby booms at all. There are fewer takers. So right. it looks like this one is probably not going to... Uh, you know, so so one, you this assumption that you could have more children, that people will, then a lot of people are saying, no, we're not. And two, even if they did have all these children, it takes 25 years to grow, you know, 20 years to right. grow a worker. <laughs> so these things that we see, these patterns are set yeah. already for the next 20 years. There's no change. These bachelors are not going to get wives. They're not, you know, women don't spring up overnight into wives. Right. Yeah, it's just not going to happen. So there will be uh, quite a bit of unhappiness, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and you also talk about how um, the one-child policy, by at this point, even if they could have as many children as they want, many of them don't want to because this policy has infected the culture. Well, you you can't spend thirty five years on relentless propaganda telling everybody that one child is the best, the most, without having some of it stick. Anybody who thinks propaganda doesn't work doesn't believe in a billion dollar advertising industry at all. You know, is there any solution at this point? I mean, um, certainly not a short-term fix like they like they had the first time around or thought they had. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I don't know because, you know, if you look at past history or, or recent history, you look at all the other countries around. Other countries have also tried to turn on the baby tap. It is a developed world uh, problem, you know. Um, they ha Most countries have not found a solution to that. You can't yeah. coerce women into having children as easily as you can coerce women into not having children. Uh, you need the carrot, not the stick. And carrots are expensive. You know, you need huge um, subsidies for childcare, schooling, education, all these things. And um, does China have the money for it? it, it the, the problem is it's arrived at this developed world problem without having quite arrived at the developed world economic status yet. China's uh, economy is what? A sixth of North, uh, South Korea's, you know, yeah. a, nine, a tenth almost of, of, of America's. It's expensive. And don't forget, while you have to spend on all this, are you going to spend on this or are you going to spend on taking care of that, that um, you know, retiree population that's bigger than all of Europe? You know, it's a <laughs> lot of calls in the purse. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot for them to handle. Well, you know, I'll wrap up now, but I just want to ask you a question that always, it's been on my mind and it's really largely unrelated to this, but you do touch upon it in the book. I've just always been curious. In China, you have a secular society that does not or has not allowed religion, yet you have all this culture of luck. More than any other culture that I have ever encountered in my life, this obsession with luck and omens and prosperity. numerology. Yeah, prosperity, numerology, lucky colors, lucky addresses. You know, if you own a house, you have a hard time selling a house that's built on a T. Or half to, a to four Chinese number. Buyers. Or half a what? <laughs> number four. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, is number four unlucky? Four, yeah, the four, the word sounds like death. So, um, oh, but number but eight, eight sell good. Really lucky. Yeah. Eight's In fact, good. you were born on a lucky year, right? I yeah, I was born on August 8th, so that's considered very lucky. Yeah, so where does that come from? I've always wondered that. Well, I think part of it is based in fact. So, okay, so the, 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 the system of religious beliefs in China is a combination of um, Taoism, Buddhism. It's a mix. So there's no strong Judeo-Christian tradition there right. at all. And a lot of it's based on a principle of rebirth. Um, so you you will you know you don't get into a system of eternal rest you know you know you die and then you go so you do believe that there's rebirth there's an afterlife and the afterlife they believe in is very similar to this life there's bureaucracy okay. there's halls and there's also money you can take it with you so you oh, can see in this premise why luck is so important also you know um you know for a long time especially China in the last thirty years has been likened to America at the turn of the century uh -huh. the Horatio Alger you can. Yeah. you know pull yourself up by the bootstraps oh, you can go up really? you you know that we're not beholden by a system of class to yeah. that degree we can go up and up and up and higher and higher and higher okay so, so and, the luck plays into that sense of upward mobility yes um the need for prosperity you know yeah. uh, we are very numeric we are very interested in money uh, <laughs> i know and i'm not stereotyping this but the, the part of it's built into the system from the time you are born to the time you die 
money is exchange you know so so okay. we we think about it okay so yeah <laughs> well, so, and unless say so the you, unlike say I'm the western that culture anyone thinks about money up more than americans but. <laughs> well hey look compare western culture for example yeah. the first time a child uh, has any kind of an introduction to money is in a belief that some strange mythical being is going to leave some money under his pillow right. for his molars <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How is that realistic? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, that's interesting because I always wondered about that. Well, your book is called One Child, The Story of China's Most Radical Experiment. Mei Fong, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Thanks again to Mei Fong for coming on the show. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd encourage you to read her new book, One Child, The Story of China's Most Radical Experiment. I'll include an Amazon link where you can order it in the show notes for this episode and on our website at kickasspolitics.com. Or if you'd prefer to listen to the audio version, you can download that for free through a special trial offer just for our listeners at audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. You can follow Mei Fong at meifong.com, that's spelled M-E-I-F-O-N-G, or you can follow her on Twitter at at Writer. Be sure to subscribe to Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes and leave us a review. And if you really want to help out, then donate to our GoFundMe campaign at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics or click on the Donate button on our website at kickasspolitics.com. Follow us on Twitter at at KAPolitics, or visit Kickass Politics on Facebook. And while you're there, recommend Kickass Politics to your friends on your social media. As always, I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickasspolitics.com. In the next episode... We're taking a break from politics. In case you haven't noticed, I'm doing more episodes on general interest topics such as science, entertainment, business, etc. And from time to time, I'm going to have people on just because they have a unique perspective on something that interests me or I admire them, or just because maybe I think it would be fun to have comedy legend Carl Reiner on the show. So I'm going to. On the next episode, Carl Reiner will talk about the early days of television and his start in show business as a writer and co-star of Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows. He'll also talk about how the antics of himself and his fellow writers Mel Brooks and Neil Simon on The Sid Caesar Show inspired him to create the beloved Dick Van Dyke Show. We'll talk about his scary brush with McCarthyism and how he avoided naming names. We'll discuss writing and directing with a young Steve Martin on such comedy classics as The Jerk, the Man with Two Brains, and All of Me. And of course, we'll talk about being best friends with Mel Brooks for 65 years and counting, and how those two came up with their famous 2,000-year-old man routine. And speaking of 2,000-year-old men, he'll reveal his secrets for staying sharp and keeping a sense of humor at age 92. Coming up with comedy legend Carl Reiner on the next podcast. But for now... I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics. Politics is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc. Okay, so good.